So today, interestingly enough, Pastor Kevin, the the, uh, my, the the topic of my message this morning is stand firm. <laughs> All right. So you already you already let you already opened the door. So here we go. All right. <laughs> So let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever had one of those times when you have felt completely overwhelmed or outmatched by your circumstances? By something that's been going on in your life and you just are just feeling woo, like I'm not sure what to do, where to go, where to turn. All right. Yeah? Okay. How many of you have had those nights, maybe more than one night in a row where you have slept like a baby, tossing and turning and crying all night long. All right, yeah? All right, you've had those nights where you just can't, it just, it, because every time you turn, it's just turning the problem over another direction, right? Okay, and you're trying, you know, somewhere in there, you're maybe trying to pray, but honestly, at least if you're like me, it's like, eh, the prayer doesn't feel like it's going very far, but there's certainly the anxiety and the frustration and the, all that's going back and forth. All right, well, if you've had that experience, then welcome to humanity, because I think we all have, and I certainly have. And several months ago, I was having one of those times. I was... Uh, facing a situation, you know, I was a pastor for over 30 years, for 26 years. I pastored our sister church in, uh, in St. Paul, Bethel Christian Fellowship, uh, where Pastor Steve Rasmussen is now uh, the new pastor doing a fantastic job. But I was there for 26 years, and then a year and a half ago, I stepped into leading the Pilgrim Center for Reconciliation. And honestly, um, I know how to pastor, but leading this organization and leading the work of reconciliation... How many of you know that the enemy is not real excited about reconciliation? And how many of you know, sometimes you think, well, you know, uh, it wouldn't it be wonderful to, to get a promotion into a new, you know, if you're, if you're aspiring into leadership, which is not a wrong thing at all, but just recognize when you aspire to leadership or when God sort of expands your territory, that also expands the target on your back. All right? And it, all it means is that the spiritual warfare amplifies along with the authority and responsibility, okay? So that's certainly true in my experience over the last 18 months. And I feel, you know, I, I'm certainly, you know, there's been an expanding of the work that God has called me to do, and there's been an expanding of some of the challenges that come with that as well, all right? So I was in the midst of one of these situations, and I was not figuring out how to get from point A to point F, much less even to point B, from where I was standing, all right? So I was feeling overwhelmed, outmatched, and I was wrestling around in my head and in my heart and wasn't sleeping, had several sleepless nights in a row where just, you know, you're just not waking refreshed at all uh, because it feels like you're hardly sleeping, all right? So one morning after this was happening, I was, at, at that particular time, I was in the middle of uh, reading through the book of Isaiah, and honestly, somehow, God put a new verse in the Bible, okay? I don't know if that ever happens to you, but I mean, you know, I, I don't know, at least, I mean, I'm sure I'd read it, I don't know how many times before, but I had never seen this verse before in my life, where he had no conscious memory of ever having read it. But in that moment, in my situation, in the circumstance I was standing in, it was the voice of God into my situation and into my heart at that moment. And the verse said this. Be careful. Keep calm. Don't be afraid. Do not lose heart. He touched me. Oh. And it was one of those moments where suddenly this word came into my spirit and nothing externally changed, but everything changed. Do you know what I'm talking about? Nothing changes out here, but suddenly your whole perspective shifts and changes. And so those of you that are looking for the address on that, go to page 488 in your pew Bible, or... 
Isaiah chapter 7. And that scripture is in verse 4 of this broader picture of Isaiah 7, 1 to 17. And just a little bit later on in that same scripture in Isaiah chapter 7, he says this in Isaiah 7, 9. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. So my alternate title for this message is Stand Tall or Don't Stand at All. <laughs> stand Tall or Don't Stand at All. Because if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. So my question to us this morning is simply this. How can I stand firm in my faith? That's the question that I'd like us to take a look at this morning. How can I stand firm in my faith? But before we begin to answer that question, I need to give you just a little bit of context, all right? So uh, those of you, have you found Isaiah 7? I think you're going to want to find it, either in your Bible, your pew Bible, on your phone Bible. Please don't use that for Facebook right now. You can do that later, all right? But Isaiah chapter 7. Now, here's something that's going to be kind of startling, so hang with me for a moment. But one of the very interesting things about Isaiah 7, just be prepared, ooh and ah, Isaiah 7 follows, wait for it, immediately after Isaiah chapter 6. All right, everybody? Ooh, ah, wow, this guy's, this guy's pretty smart. Okay? Isaiah 7 follows after Isaiah 6. But there's something really important about that. See, Isaiah chapter 6, you may not know it right now, but you know probably, you've heard scripture from Isaiah chapter 6. Because Isaiah chapter 6 begins with, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And all the angels cried, Holy, holy, holy. And the doorpost shook in the smoke, and the seraphim and cherubim, and he, Isaiah falls down on his face, saying, Woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And the Lord comes and takes, the, the seraphim comes, the angel comes, takes a, 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 a coal from the altar and touches his lips. And then the Lord says, who will go for us? Who shall I send? And what does Isaiah say? Here I am. Send me, pick me. I'll go. And we usually stop there. But the end of Isaiah 6 says, I'm going to send you. And where I'm going to send you is, I'm going to send you to a people who are not going to listen to you. And I'm going to send you to a people who are not going to do what you tell them to do. Now that's an encouraging word right there. <laughs> okay? I'm going to send you out, but they're not going to listen to you. They're not going to, they're not going to follow the words you say because... They're just not, because they're hard to hard, but, but I'm still, I'm sending you. And then, between Isaiah 6 and Isaiah 7, there is 16 years. 16 years from Isaiah chapter 6 to Isaiah chapter 7, because Isaiah chapter 7 <coughs> begins when King Ahaz is king in Judah, who is the grandson of Uzziah. So for 16 years, Isaiah has this incredible revelation of God. And maybe some of you have had this revelation of, of, of God or a revelation of something that he's put into your spirit, a calling that he's put upon your life, a dream, a vision, an aspiration that's, that, that, that's been God-breathed, God-birthed into your life. And then, 16 years, 
We don't have any recorded prophecies of Isaiah. We don't have any knowledge of the work that he did for 16 years. There is this seemingly cone of silence. There's this obscurity that is upon his life. And perhaps this morning you're in that place where you feel like you've heard from the Lord something, but it feels like there is a season, a long protracted season of waiting and obscurity. Here's what I want to encourage you with today. God has not forgotten your name. He has not forgotten your address. He has not forgotten the things that he has put into your heart. This is not a sign of his rejection. It is a part of his preparation because before he ever makes a ministry, he makes a man or a woman first. So don't be discouraged if it feels like there's this sort of obscurity thing. And I think even sometimes collectively we can get there. Doesn't anybody know who we are or where we are or what we're doing? It's okay. Yes, there is one who knows. His name is Jesus. And he's preparing and he builds foundations and he does preparation before he releases his people into the work that he's called them to do. Anybody? Do I have any witness out here? Yes? Amen? Y'all are quiet. All right. You can talk to me. I know you're going to be shouting later this afternoon one way or another. So you can shout now. All right. So, all right. So now we come to Isaiah chapter 7. When Ahaz, son of Jotham, here we are, the son of Uzziah, okay, it's the grandson, was king of Judah, king resident of Aram, and Pekah, son of Ramalia, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. Now, i got to give you one more piece of context for this, all right? So the context is this. The, the, Israel has been split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. And Syria is over here. That's who Aram is. Syria and Israel are coming to fight against Judah. Why are they coming to fight against Judah? Because Assyria is the big 100-pound gorilla in the neighborhood. That is the empire that's ready to take over everyone. And so Israel and Syria, or Aram and Ephraim, want to take over Judah to get them to join them against Assyria. But Ahaz has already made a decision. His decision is, I'm going to make an alliance with Assyria against Israel and Syria because instead of getting beaten by these two littler ones, I'm going to ally myself with the big gorilla so that I can be saved. Well, in fact, spoiler alert, that is exactly what Ahaz ends up doing because he's determined to do that and it results in Judah ultimately just getting swallowed up by Assyria and taken over and destroyed. Okay? So he's got his own plan that he's already figured out in advance of how he's going to get out of the problem that he's in because he's about ready Judah is once again about ready to be put the, you know the, the thumb screws are about ready to go down on them again from Aram and from Ephraim from Syria and from Israel on Judah now look at what it says here it says now the house of David was told Verse 2, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim, so the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. What a powerful description 
of what our hearts are like when we're in those situations where we feel overwhelmed and outmatched. It's like the leaves inside of us are like this, right? And they're shaking with fear, with anxiousness, with bewilderment, with confusion, and they shake. So here's my question to us. Go ahead, put up the next. The, the, the first step for us in learning to stand firm is to recognize your vulnerabilities. Recognize the things. So, so um, this, this morning, during worship, you mentioned about paying attention. God's doing business with us. And he's doing business around some of those strongholds, those things that in our life. Have you ever, have you yet figured out that in your life, those places of your vulnerability are the places that the challenges seem to come back around over and over and over again? Some people are always having relationship problems. Okay? Have you ever had somebody who's been like, I, I, I've had this person in my life, uh, not in my family, but just, you know, in pastoral ministry, who every boss that they had was just horrible. Every single one. I'm like, wow. You got 100%? Really? Huh. Ah, what? possibly might be the common denominator in every work situation that you've been in. Hmm. Right? Okay? Or every, you know, whatever it is, somebody who every time, it's a, it's a financial issue all the time. It's always a financial, it's always something going on. All right? There's always something out there. It's those people, that thing, that whatever. But somehow, if we don't have the self-awareness to recognize our vulnerability, we will never be able to stand firm. So here's, a, here's, here's an opportunity for you. Maybe go to somebody you trust, somebody who can speak truth to you and say, do you notice any reoccurring patterns in my life? Ooh. Mm -mm -mm. Do you notice any places where I seem to struggle on a consistent basis where it seems to come back over and over and over again? Whatever it is. The first, this is sort of counterintuitive, but the first step to standing firm is to realize the places where you don't. Where it's a struggle for you. And for Ahaz, and for the people here, it's this vulnerability is... Well, they're about to be attacking it. Now, they actually had won the last time Israel and, and Aram had come against them. They had repelled the attack, but now they're coming again, and their hearts are doing this. So pay attention to the external circumstances around you, but also pay attention to your internal reactions to those circumstances. The second step now is to receive God's word. Receive God's word into your life. Now here's, we're going to walk through these fairly quickly, but walk with me because these are significant. And these are the words that I began the message with just a few minutes ago. All right? These are the words from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 4. For the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out and your son Shear Jashub, and I don't have time to tell you the prophetic significance of his name, but there is, to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the launderer's field. Now, notice God gives him very clear direction because he knows where Ahaz is going to be. Because Ahaz is up there in the upper aqueduct. Why is he doing that? Anybody, there would be like major extra sermon points if anybody can tell me why do you think Ahaz was up and at the aqueduct up at the upper pools? Anybody just give me a... Woohoo! You the man. Check in his water supply because of the invasion. You get the you get all the extra sermon points. I don't have anything to give you, but I can give you a cough drop. Um, <laughs> but, uh, that's about it. All right. He's checking his water supply. 
Because he has already made his plan. And how many of us, when we have faced situations and circumstances bigger than us, have made our plan? I can't tell you how many times, I mean, this has happened to me at least twice, maybe more. This is the honest truth, where I have had my plan, I've laid it all out, it's beautifully done, I present it to God, and He says, thank you so much for your input. Now would you like to hear what I'm thinking about? I love when He said, thank you for your input. So, hear the words, be careful. So, say to him, so Isaiah, go up there where he is and say, be careful, keep calm, don't be afraid, do not lose heart. Because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood, these the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and of the son of Ramalia. So, the... the question or the, the encouragement to us today is what is God's word to your heart and your situation today? What's God's word? So here's what I believe is a word from the Lord to your heart and to your situation right now where you are at or where you're going to be at in six months or a year from now or maybe six weeks or maybe when you walk outside that door or maybe you just walked out of a situation. But here is a word from the Lord that you can hang on to. All right? I've got this word now. Be careful. Keep calm. Don't be afraid and don't lose heart. I have it on an index card right on my desk to remind me every day, here's a word from the Lord to your heart for this season for now. Be careful. Let's talk about that. Be careful. Be careful. The Apostle Peter was speaking to a church, writing to a church that was in the midst of incredible persecution. He says in 1 Peter 4, 7, The end of all things is near, therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you can pray. Just a chapter later in 1 Peter 5, he says a similar thing. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. So the word to be careful means that we need to be alert and of sober mind. Go ahead and put it on up there. We need to be keeping our guard up and staying alert. Because there will be temptations all around you. The very temptations that Ahaz was facing of how to get out of the problems and the church in the midst of persecution was trying to figure out what to do. And Peter says, in the midst of that, be alert and of sober mind. Keep your guard up and stay alert. Stay awake. Don't let the world put you to sleep. Don't let your circumstances, don't bury your head in the sand. Don't simply try to avoid or to do the, you know, I mean, we often get into the fight or flight or freeze mode, but there is another way, and that is by fixing our eyes on Jesus, being careful, being sober-minded, and being alert, using our wise mind. Romans 12 says, have your mind transformed by the renewing of your, what, mind. Be careful. Keep calm. It's the second word. Keep calm. Most of us, I mean, you know, Philippians chapter 4, you can quote it with me. Do not be anxious about most things. But in most of the situations you're facing. I think that's the translation most of us use, right? But God, you don't know about my situation. I know you've been, you've been at this a really long time, God. And you've done some really big stuff, but do you see what I'm facing? Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, 
by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends, it's not, it's not something that makes sense. It transcends your understanding. It transcends what you can figure out yourself. Will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Trust in the one who is greater than your circumstances and greater than your heart and greater than your thoughts. Trust in him. He's greater than your circumstances, your heart, and your thoughts. I don't know about you, but right now, there's not a lot of calmness in our world. And certainly not a lot of calmness in our country. There's just a whole lot of dust in the air. And there's a whole lot of swirling stuff. And man, every day, it's like you wake up and go, now what is going to be happening today? And the winds are blowing, and everybody, and you know, and all everybody does is sort of keeps amplifying and intensifying the anxiety. There's this free-floating anxiety that's out there because it's like, you know, what's going to happen next? And into that, I believe that there's an invitation to us, the church, at this time. With all of the polarization and division that's happening, with all the distractions, with all of the stuff that's going on, there's an invitation to the church to use modern psychological language to be a non-anxious presence in the world. Because guess what? We know how things end. We know where it's going. We know that God actually, actually, actually is in control even when it doesn't feel like that. Okay? Have you gotten a hold of that? Can we get a hold of that? Yes? Hello? Hello? Some of you are going to need this word at about 5.15 this afternoon, depending on how things are going in the football game, all right? You just lovingly say to your spouse, do you remember the word this morning in church? Keep calm. <laughs> All right, going on. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Now, you know this. You probably heard this. Your pastor may have mentioned this. You know, somebody added up all the fear knots in the Bible, and there's about 365. One for every day. Maybe there's 366. Even the period day gets one. All right? Fear not. One of the great passages of, that says don't be afraid is found in Exodus chapter 14. It's when the people of Israel are being brought out by Moses. They're coming out of Egypt and they're going towards the promised land. And the problem is, is the Red Sea is between where they are and where they're going. And so they're caught literally between the rock and the hard place. The Red Sea and the Egyptian army is coming after them. And as the Egyptian army comes after them, all the people say, Collectively. Ah! <laughs> right? Why did you ever take us out of here? Don't you remember we had great leeks and onions back in the oil? You brought us out. What are you doing, Moses? And I love what Moses answers. He says, don't be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The, the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Don't be afraid. A friend of Annette and I did a deep dive into that phrase, fear not. And here's the way that she has paraphrased it. Here's what she discovered that it really means. It means this. I know that you are afraid. Go ahead. I know, I understand that you're afraid. But don't run, stand, because I have something for you. Sometimes it's a perfectly natural, normal, and even expected and understandable response to be afraid. There are times when I'm traveling and I'm in places I'm afraid. When I'm out in the middle of nowhere and the lights go out and people start banging on doors and I don't know what's going on, I'm afraid. Sorry. 
okay? Didn't mean to shatter your illusions of the great, you know, whatever. It's not, you, you can be afraid. I understand you're afraid. But don't run. Stand. I have something for you. This morning, wherever you are, you're caught between that rock and that hard place. I understand. Don't run. Stand. I have something for you. God will fight for you. And then do not lose heart. This is the, the fourth word. Don't lose heart. Do not lose heart. Just a little later in the book of Isaiah, there's this wonderful scripture. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in it will not be disturbed. Literally, their heart will not be disturbed. And if I'm honest with you this morning, which I will be, this is probably the one that I am challenged with the most in the sense of not losing heart. Because I don't know about you, but it sometimes feels like I'm in this ministry of reconciliation. It does not think, feel like in this season of time that things are pulling together. It feels like things are pulling more further apart. Or I don't know if you've been in situations where it seems like you're in the middle of something and, and it just seems like things are not improving. Things are not getting better. Things are more... Or you're facing that challenge that you faced 473 times before and you're like, God, here I am again. And you're ready to lose heart. But my encouragement to you this morning is to take your heart and recognize that there is a sure, secure foundation for your heart. Go ahead, put it up. There is a sure, secure foundation on which you can rest your heart. So this morning, if you feel like you're about ready to lose heart, here's my encouragement to you. Do not lean into your despair. Lean your heart and rest it on the firm Sure, secure foundation, the cornerstone that will not be moved. Amen? Amen? Yes. This is the place to rest your heart. Rest your heart. Mm -hmm. Yes. Rest your heart in me. And stand firm. Stand firm. Now we come full circle. It's the fifth and final word in this particular passage. Stand firm. Because it goes on in Isaiah chapter 7. You, you see it here. Whoops. Sorry. Wait a minute. Hold on one minute, second. Uh, here we go. Right after verse 4, verse 5, verse 6. Let us invade um, Aram. Ephraim and the son of Ramalia, Aram, Ephraim and Ramalia's son have plotted your ruin, saying, Let us invade Judah, let us tear it apart and divide it among ourselves, make the son of Tabeel king over it. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord says, it will not take place, it will not happen. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only resin, and within sixty five years Ephraim too will be shattered. Two shattered to be a people, and the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Ramalia's son. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. Stand firm. And go ahead, put up, that's good, the Ephesians 6. Thank you again, Pastor Calvin, for helping to preach the message before I got there. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything to stand, stand firm. As Woody Allen once said, 90% of life is showing up. Show up. In your family, show up. On your job, show up. In your church, show up. In your community, show up and stand firm. Stand firm. When you've done everything else, keep standing. 
Keep standing. Recognize your vulnerability. Receive God's word. But there's one more thing to this standing firm. And this is so cool. Remember God's promise. Remember God's promise. We've got to go on just a little bit further now. Run with me right to the end here. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, verse 10. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I'll not ask. I'll not put the Lord to the test. He's sounding real spiritual here, folks. I'm not going to put the Lord to the test. Tells us in Deuteronomy, don't put the Lord to the test. I can't do that. Well, guess what? You can put the Lord to the test when he tells you to. He told Ahaz, put me to the test. But Ahaz didn't want to because Ahaz had already decided what he was going to do. He actually didn't want to receive God's word. But then it says, I'll not ask. Then Isaiah said, well, hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel. Did you know that that's the context for this prophetic promise about Jesus? Is this context of Ahaz being overwhelmed and outmatched by his circumstances? So remember for you today, now we're past Advent, we're into the new year, but it's still as true today as it was three weeks ago before Christmas. This is not the only time that this scripture needs to be quoted. Because you and I need to remember that when you are outmatched by your circumstances and overwhelmed by the situations around you and your heart is troubled within you, remember this. He has been, he is, and he will always be Emmanuel, God with us. So here's the great news as we bring this message to a close and the worship team comes on up right now is this. The great news is that in the middle of your circumstance, in the middle of your situation where you feel outmatched and where you feel outnumbered and where you are overwhelmed, the reality is this. You are not alone. You and God are together in this and one person with God is a majority. And he is with you today. And so this is not a message out of Second Hesitations 417, which says pull yourselves up by your bootstraps and just grit your teeth and work a little bit harder. No, this is a message out of the Word of God, which reminds you today that God is with you in the middle of whatever it is that you are going through, or whatever you're going to be going through six months from now, or whatever you just went through. God is with you. He is with us. He has been with Fountain of Life. He is with Fountain of Life. He will be with Fountain of Life. Because He is who He is, which is faithful. Always and forever. He is faithful. And trustworthy. So you can come to Him today. With your heart doing this. With your heart shaking like leaves in a tree in the middle of a hurricane. He's got you. He's with you. You're not alone.